we are in part two um, of my what to say to somebody who is in a cult, particularly the cult of Branimism. If you have not already watched part one, I highly recommend it. In that part, I just basically go through um, how to even approach a conversation that it has such high stakes and so difficult to have. And I run through scriptures of um, just nuggets of wisdom for from the Bible of how you could have a conversation like that. This video is going to be some great questions and verses that you can actually read with the person when you're having that conversation, when you can actually read that with your with your friend, with your family member who is still in the message or in um, another cult. You could tweak these questions a little bit and use that for if they're in a different cult. I'm a Christian, so I'm going at this from the perspective of how do I help you with scripture particularly. So that's um, just a little disclaimer there. I'm going to be in the English Standard Version as I usually am. It's not the one and only version. I just happen to, to think it's really easy to read and pretty good translation. I'm going to start with the question, where is your standard of truth? Is it the Bible? And this one I think is just really important because um, this will see, you'll see if they're teachable from scripture because if their standard of truth, they immediately say, well, my standard of truth is Branham um, or my standard of truth is what comes from the pulpit. Then the conversation is going to be a little bit harder. But if their standard of truth is the Bible, then you can use the Bible to share with them why the message is wrong and why William Branham um, is a false uh, prophet. So we have 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, Proverbs 30, uh, verse 5, and Isaiah 40, verse 8. So we'll just, I'm going to read through all of these for you. First one says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The next one in Proverbs says, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. The next verse says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. I am of the, the view, which I believe is biblical from everything that I've read, um, that the Bible is inerrant um, and sufficient for us. Um, that means basically it has no errors in it. And the contents of scripture, um, particularly the gospel of Jesus Christ, is sufficient for salvation. You don't need to add anything more. And it's complete. Um, there's not going to be another Bible or anything before Christ returns. That's it. The Bible is complete. It's sufficient. And it's inerrant. Everything in it is true and trustworthy. That's the perspective that I'm coming from, which I believe is a biblical perspective. And if you look into scripture, I believe that you'll find the same thing. So that goes back to this question. When you're addressing this with a message believer, you can dive into these scriptures with them, ask them what you think those scriptures mean, ask them where is your standard of truth? Is it the Bible? And from these verses, it's pretty clear that it should be the Bible. But what are they saying? What are they answering? Now, hopefully they answer yes, because that'll make things a little bit less complicated moving forward. Um, if they don't answer yes, I would challenge that um, in a kind way and ask them why. Just ask questions all throughout. Um, this is not a script for you to follow, but rather I just want it to be a bit of a guide. If you've never had this kind of conversation before, you don't know where to begin, or you've tried to have a conversation and it hasn't gone super well, um, these are just, this is just a new way for you to approach the conversation. And so by all means, go off the grid and ask those questions. Ask lots of questions we talked about in the last video. Be slow to speak, quick to listen. Um, the next question is, shouldn't we put Branham under the test? If not, why? The verses that I have are 1 John 4. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, Acts 17, 10 to 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15, and Revelation uh, 2, 8 
two, two, at least in the sect of Branhamism that I grew up in. And I believe most from what I've heard, you're not supposed to question anything. You're not supposed to doubt anything. You're supposed to take what Brandon says as true at face value and not look into it further. Um, as though somehow looking into it further is blaspheming the Holy Spirit or something like that, which it's not because William Branham is not the Holy Spirit. And even if you're questioning Holy Spirit and how it works, like that's not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That could be a whole other video of what it means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So I'm not going to get into that, but I just think that this question is important because from these verses, you'll see that it's biblical to question and put a leader unto the test, which is not something that I've seen in any of the message churches. I'm not seeing people examining what Branham is saying under the scrutiny of scripture, but rather taking what Branham says and then applying and then interpreting scripture through the lens of what Branham said instead of the other way around. First John 4 says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Seems pretty clear what we should be doing. Next one I have is 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, which says, but test everything, hold fast what is good. So don't take something at face value, test it, test it with scripture and take the parts that are good and don't take the other parts. This next one says, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if the things were true. This one I think is, again, really clear. Um, in Acts, these Jews in, um, let's see, Berea, I don't know if I'm saying that uh, town correctly, but these Jews in the synagogue who are listening to Paul and Silas are commended for questioning, for listening to what is said eagerly and examining the scriptures to see if what is being said is true. Now, obviously in this context, um, Paul and Silas are sharing the, the news of Jesus and the Jews would be examining the Old Testament to see if the prophecies and everything lined up with this new information about Jesus that they were receiving. If there was ever something that would be um, terrible for us to question, it would be the gospel of Jesus, right? But it, no, these people are actually being commended for questioning whether or not Jesus is the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies. So how much more should we question a man who is supposed, supposedly a prophet uh, of the end times than these people questioning whether or not Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies? I think it's pretty clear, it's more noble. It says here, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why were they more noble? Because they were here receiving the word with all eagerness and examining the scriptures daily to see if the words were true. So yeah, let's keep moving on. This one says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise that if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. I share this uh, scripture because I think the argument of, well, Branham is so amazing, or I saw him, do, him, uh, my mom saw him in the meetings, and he is this amazing man, and how could you even question him? His words are clearly um, beautiful and righteous. It's saying, no, like, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. You've got to question that. Revelation 2, 2 says, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. Again, 
you got to test. You got to test whether that person is an apostle, is a prophet. Um, and I think that's a pretty sufficient amount of scripture um, to drive home that point. Again, that question is, shouldn't we put Branham under the test? If not, why? Now, the next question is, hypothetically, if the Bible said a doctrine different than Branham, who is right? That's just, I've got no scriptures for that question. I've just got the question. It's uh, kind of rhetorical after the other questions we've had, um, because clearly if the Bible is the standard of truth, then if anything is inconsistent with the Bible, the Bible trumps anything that anybody else said, including Branna, including somebody who you think is 100% true. Um, so that's just a, I put, you know, it's hypothetical um, because in the next video, I will go into some things that are um, inconsistent with scripture that Branham said. Um, and um, if you have some of those examples as well um, that you thought were compelling, please drop them in the comments and I will maybe include them in the next video. The next question, question four is, if the Bible clearly disproved Branham was who he said he was, would you stop following him? If not, why? I think this question is really important because you might actually get somebody saying, no, I will never stop following him because I know it's true. And if the Bible says something different, that inconsistency is something that I'm probably just reading wrong um, or I'm misunderstanding something, I will never leave the message. And at that point, maybe table a conversation and have it, try to have it again at another point. Um, unfortunately, some people may answer it that way. Um, and it's just good to walk through these points because I think like the first question, where's your standard of truth? Is it the Bible? Somebody might say the Bible, but actually it's Branham. When you get to these harder questions, like if the Bible disproved Branham, would you stop following him? then it gets a little tricky because you realize where you actually stand. And for instance, I would have said before, um, when I was in the message, I probably would have said, yeah, the Bible is a standard of truth. But in actuality, I was um, believing in Branham's interpretation of scripture as the standard of truth. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Um, the next question I have, which I have a bunch of verses for, again, is um, if something feels right, does that make it right? Um, I have this in there because I think some people um, will just argue like, I know it's true because I felt the anointing or I have felt God move in my life or my life has changed because of this. And they're claiming that as the reason that it's right because they know that it's right, their heart, um, and they can't be convinced. That's where I challenge them with scripture because maybe their standard of truth is what Branham says, maybe their standard of truth is their own emotion versus the Bible. Let's read a few of these verses. Um, I've got Jeremiah 17, 9, Timothy 4, 3, Proverbs 12, 15, and Proverbs 28, 26. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? As much as we like to think and believe in the fairy tale that our heart is pure, um, our heart is sinful. That's why God needs to give us a new heart. Um, and even with God giving us a new heart, we still have this competing nature that is a sinful nature competing with our new identity in Christ that's going to be there even after you um, are a believer in Christ. So you can't just just believe something because your emotions are telling you that it's true. This next one says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachings to suit their own passions. I have seen this as well. People who have certain convictions um, will look towards, look to find a certain teacher that aligns with that, whether or not those certain convictions are 
something clearly laid out in scripture or not, because they have these certain convictions, they will look for that one person who will say that. That works both in ways of you think that you should be able to um, drink in excess and party and smoke where marijuana. Well, you're just gonna you're gonna try to find somebody who's teaching that those things are okay, and those that can also mean if you think that dressing modestly is more godly and more righteous, you're going to be looking for a teacher who is saying. This is how you need, this is how women need to dress. They need to dress X, Y, Z, and that's the only biblical way for a woman to dress modestly. If you have itching ears, it can just happen like that. So, and it works both ways and things that seem super like godly and things that seem super um, ungodly, it can work both ways. You have itching ears, you want to hear a certain thing and that's what you're looking for. This next one says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. It's pretty clear. Um, you think something's right because you are thinking it, and that doesn't make it right. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're not right just because you think you're right. Doesn't work like that. Proverbs 28, 26. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. So yeah, just because you think you're right doesn't mean you're right. I was extremely proud of my belief in the message and was so sure that I was it was right. And when it turned out it's not right, it's like, wow, that's extremely humbling. Don't get me wrong, I carried on pride and still struggle, struggle with pride to this day, but um, it's pretty humbling to figure out that um, something you thought was right and were so proud of being right is actually wrong. Um, but it happens because we're not the ultimate authority on what is true. The Bible is. Next question is, if Branham contradicts himself or tells stories drastically, drastically different, does that mean some of the things he says are false? or possibly lies. And this question goes back to what I was saying before about some people believing that Branham, Branham's words are absolute truth. You can't have an absolute truth contradict itself. And also, if you're contradicting yourself, um, that could be a lie, right? Um, and so in the next part, I will go into some of those blatant lies that Brandon made. Um, but for now, I just want to like set the scene. I want you to set the scene with the person you're talking with that opens them up to the idea that if he says something inconsistent or if he told a story differently, um, you need to pay attention to that and not just glaze over it. It's actually a big deal. Um, and to prove it's a big deal, I've got Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 which says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Proverbs 19, 9 says, A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies will perish. Um, it's kind of harsh, um, but it's scripture. Um, the next one is Colossians 3, 9 to 10, which says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So, I don't want to go fully into this, but if you are a believer, you're going to see good fruit in your life. Um, you're going to see sanctification, and that might be slow, that might be over a long period of time, but um, that would also apply to, to Branham. If he is a regenerate believer, he should be um, not lying, and as a um, authority figure, and as a 
a shepherd figure, as a leader, he should be held to a higher standard because he is shepherding this flock. You should see the fruit of God's Holy Spirit working in him, and um, you shouldn't see consistent lies. And obviously, if he's lying or saying things inconsistently, that means that not everything he's saying is 100% true. And that's something that, um, as you're sharing with this, sharing with the message believer that you're talking to, that's hopefully a conclusion that they can come to just logically by themselves is, oh yeah, I mean, it can't be 100% true if some of the things are inconsistent. Um, my last question I have for y'all to ask this message believer is, do the leaders of your church show fruit of the spirit? So kind of going along to my little um, mini rant that I gave um, on the last uh, question, we've got Matthew 7, 15 to 20, Galatians 5, 22 to 23, and Colossians 3, 12, and 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 5. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read those here for you real quick. The first one says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 is next, and it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Colossians 3, 12 says, Put on, then, as God's chosen holy ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. The next one we have is... 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 5. Um, and that one says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, and it is not irritable or resentful. So that question again, the last question is, do the leaders of your church show fruit of the Spirit? Those are the questions that I have as um way to start this conversation with the message believer in your life um, to hopefully start to open up their heart to the idea that the message could be wrong, um, using scripture as a guide. If they respond to um, these questions uh, with dismissal or anger, defensiveness, I don't know that you can go further than this right now um, because you're literally using questions and asking uh, asking them those questions based on scripture. And if they're not receptive to that, I don't know that they're teachable in the season that they are in right now. And that's something that's hard to accept, but maybe true. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, again, you don't have to use this as a script, um, but instead a little guide and feel free to dig deeper, ask those difficult questions, um, and let them talk. Don't overload them with facts. Um, and just, just get them to think, get them to pause. And, um, you can always ask a couple of these questions and get into a longer conversation that goes on a different, in a different direction and come back again, uh, another day to, Approach these conversations. I don't think that one conversation with somebody is going to change their mind about their whole worldview. Um, so feel free to split this up among many conversations. And yeah, with that, that's all I've got. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you want to know when the next video is up. And I will see you next time. Bye!